Imagine if you were a doctor before the Civil War. Chances are you have not performed surgery. Then the war came and you had to perform it in abundance. Hi, I'm Robert Hicks, director of the Mütter Museum and Historical Medical Library of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. And welcome to another episode of Broken Bodies, Suffering Spirits, Injury, Death, and Healing in Civil War Philadelphia. Let's look at the world of the doctors and let's meet a few and find out how their war work created a new specialty in medicine. I've been asked uh, about the physicians, and in general, I think they were excellent. You have to understand that the Army consisted of hundreds of men when the CSESH fired on Fort Sumter, and in very short time, there were hundreds of thousands of men, and many sick, uh, and then after the terrible battles, many wounded. And under the circumstances, the Army did a creditable job of, of attracting um, doctors into the service and uh, the order of their devotion and, uh, and in many cases their abilities was excellent. We are at the final resting place of one of Philadelphia's and the College of Physicians' most colorful and influential physicians, Silas Weir Mitchell. His father was an accomplished Philadelphia physician, and when young Silas Weir showed an inclination towards medicine himself, the father said, you have brains but no industry, stay away from medicine. Maybe that was the right thing to say. Mitchell not only became a physician, but distinguished himself and was one of the grand men of the field by the time he died in the early 20th century. But he really came unto his own in the time of the Civil War. From the gravestone to the portrait, this is Silas Weir Mitchell, painted late in life when he was at the height of his professional career. Dr. Keene described him as a yeasty man because his mind was always in ferment. During the Civil War, he was a contract surgeon he went to Gettysburg after the third day and saw 27,000 men waiting for treatment, and that experience seared him for the rest of his life. Right after the war, he publishes a short story where the protagonist, a surgeon and a paraplegic, had all four limbs amputated owing to injuries, and it was so clinically real that people would send in cards and letters to the hospital. He coins the term the phantom limb syndrome as a result of this, and after the war, he publishes this book, Injuries of Nerves and Their Consequences, a summation of his Civil War research. This book effectively founds American neurology. Well, these are just a few of the tools in the armory of the practicing assistant surgeon or physician in military service. This small book was written by the great professor of surgery, Dr. Samuel Gross, and it is a manual of military surgery intended for the use of those new physicians in uniform. A handbook of tips that could help that physician get up to speed very quickly, and it was used by both North and South. Some treatises led to major advances in medicine, such as this one, Gunshot Wounds and Injuries of the Nerves by Dr. Keene, Mitchell, and a third physician, and it was used as a basis for a major study published right after the war. Some of the tools used on the front lines included devices as simple as this. It's a rod with porcelain ends. It's designed to be inserted into the wound in order to locate the musket ball. And it's a reminder that there was no provision for imagery to peer inside the body at this time. Now, every physician, north or south, probably possessed these two large tomes. These are by George Wood, who was a president of the College of Physicians here, and it's a treatise on the practice of medicine, a vast compendium of everyday practical knowledge. It's also a reminder that the physiology uh, underlying the structure of the body was very complex, and medicine was based on a lot of empiricism, practical experience of physicians accumulated over the years. But we also have cutting edge technology, such as this device, which generates an electrical current. It's hand cranked, generates a current, passes through these electrodes and gives a shock to the patient, designed to stimulate the nerves.
This is a medical kit of Dr. Mary Walker. She was a doctor at the time of the Civil War. Now, during the Civil War, she was outstanding enough to receive the Medal of Honor. This box later on went to her family and ended up in the hands of World War II veteran Craig Scholler, who was an outstanding soldier in the war. He did not want this to go to waste at home. He wanted to make sure it had an opportunity to be seen and enjoyed by, by so many others because he, like so many, believed in the idea of what we do here, and that's preserving the history of the Civil War. Now, as Mary, as Mary was a very strong, strong person, and when that Medal of Honor was supposedly at one time going to be taken away from her, she fought, didn't give it back, and after her death, it was reawarded back to her. And all you can say is she was some strong woman and deserved every honor she was given. The tomb of W.W. Keene. This is one physician I would have liked to take out to lunch. His breadth of professional career was just astounding. And the fact that this gravestone is very nondescript probably says a great deal about him. Dr. Williams W. Keene, the only man to serve in uniform during the Civil War and also in World War I. When the war began, he was young and inexperienced, and he described himself as Assistant Surgeon Verdant Green. At the first battle of Manassas, he was given no direction at all. He returned to medical school, came back with his degree, served at the second battle of Manassas, also ran a hospital in Washington, D.C. Later on at Gettysburg, he found himself in a tent one night trying to probe and remove a mini ball lodged in the shoulder of a soldier. He was holding a block of wood with five candles very close to the wound when the assistant, who was pouring ether onto a mask, it all caught fire. The assistant hurled the block of wood out of the tent, took the ether mask and threw it out of the tent, thus saving everyone, Dr. Keene included, from instant incineration. But his big contribution during the war was to contribute to an understanding of nerves and nervous diseases.